Mm -hmm. Just going to click record. Sure. Um, and very briefly, for those who are watching the recording, um, very briefly introduce us again. So I'm Aliona Medellian, CEO of Thematic, and with me I have Marisa Fitzgerald, former VP of Customer Experience, author of uh, four books on customer experience and net promoter score. And we're delighted to talk about um, how to use um, emotional arguments when convincing your boss. Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> and your uh, colleagues. Yeah, a way that I often think about it is that it, we're, we're going to be discussing a subject that I wish I had understood 20 years earlier. And I understood it very close to uh, when I retired. And oh. I, I realized then that you know, the way that I had been communicating, because I'm an engineer, so I was intensely rational and so on, uh, was, well, it was less effective than it could have been. And um, you know, alternate methods of communication just work a lot better. So yeah, that's what we're, we're gonna be discussing today. Excellent, so before we get started uh, in this topic, I would love to learn a little bit of your personal history. Um, so you've already shared that you're an engineer, but I know you prepared um, a slide showing how this all uh, fits into your personal life. Uh, yep, and I am just, <laughs> uh, for some reason, I have just lost that, hang on. Yes, yeah, so I've, um, um, Aliona, I've just, for some reason, lost the PowerPoint slide out of the interface here, um, but, we'll, but here. we'll get it, yeah, well. Uh, I'm trying We're to. trying to combine slides and video today, so apologies for a, um, a small technical glitch. Um, yeah, yes, my my Mac has decided that it only likes Keynote and not PowerPoint temporarily, but I, I'll fix it in just a moment. But just let me t say a few words about the personal history. Uh, yes, I was born in the, the southern part of Ireland in Cork. At, when I was nine, my parents moved to St. Louis and then to Seattle. Uh, I went back to, um, did finished high school and went to university in Ireland. My first job was um, near Athens, but Athens, Georgia, I, which I, well, let's say I was somewhat surprised to discover that not all of the United States was the same as Seattle at that at that point, and it was uh, an amazing experience to to work in Georgia and North Carolina, and briefly in Ireland before working four years in France. I've worked four years in the Netherlands. Um, I've worked in Scotland, in Spain, in Italy, and now I'm almost thirty years in Switzerland. What can I say after? Uh, after six months here, I met a woman. What can I say? And then <laughs> that was that was the end of uh, of moving around. Um, anyway, it's, you're not you're not finished. You are moving around yet. So no, and it's and it's so hard once you've lived to, in so many countries to then um, answer this very common question: Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I lived in so many countries. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm from flight LX38, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which seemed to be the way that it was quite a bit of the time. Um, so, um, you, so you worked um, both in low tech and high tech uh, throughout your career. How did you get involved in customer experience specifically? Um, yeah, so when I was, uh, the customer experience experience started off in the clothing industry. Um, we were, we had a, a whole bunch of entertaining things that we made and uh, did in the clothing industry. I worked seven years for Wrangler Jeans before going into the, into high tech. Um, and we were going through a phase where the jeans industry was in a lot of entertaining transformation. Um, we were number one in Europe. I was based in Paris at the time. 
Um, and you know, one of the threats was Edwin Jeans from Japan, uh, Lois in Spain, and and various others. But the most exciting thing go things going on were shrink to fit jeans and uh, the invention of stone washing. Um, just checking whether I'm successfully sharing my shrink to fit slide here. No. No, sorry. Whoops. Well, then I will uh, switch back to where I was. Um, Can you, um, you're not, I don't think you're yeah, sharing. Uh, it, it's fine. It, it's, it's Oh, it's there, coming. So. Yes, now, now we can see yeah, the... Yeah. So shrink to fit jeans, the principle was that you bought the jeans, they had about a 14% shrinkage in them. You, they were designed for what I can only call uh, young women, if you're allowed to say that in California. And uh, the principle was that you would put them on, you would get into an extremely hot bathtub and you would stay there for a while and let them shrink to your body and get out of the bathtub and let them dry while you were still wearing them. But what happened one day was that my boss decided, who was a man, decided to do this with a pair of these jeans in his own bathtub. And while he was waiting for the jeans to shrink, um, what he had a pumice stone, the type of stone that you use to remove you know, dry skin or things from your, uh, from your feet. And he started to rub it on the thighs of the jeans. And guess what? The, the blue dye stopped, um, started to, started to wear. And, um, the white, the white showed through. He came in to work on the following Monday, and he just came in, gave me a carton of jeans, a whole pile of pumice stones. He'd destroyed his, his washing machine at home uh, when he decided that what he would do was put jeans and pumice stones together in his washing machine. And he just told me, go and make this into a commercial process. Um, I got into pretty well immediately every type of what I would now think of rational versus emotional level of discussions. Um, first, the people at our headquarters in Greensboro, North Carolina, were radically opposed to what we were doing, which was destroying all of the high quality fabric, the extremely you know, great stitching and so on that, it, that, we, that we had. Um, and you know, this isn't at all what the, the headquarters people wanted. So I decided that because of the feedback that we were getting from the early boutiques that we were putting this stuff out in and other people had started to uh, do the same thing at roughly the same time, that I would do for the very first time a customer survey. And what I did was I went out into the boutiques in Paris uh, to get feedback. Of course, first I'd consulted with my corporate boss in Greensboro, and I received all sorts of suggestions about uh, starting from, no, you don't need to ask the customers because we already know what the customers want. And I'd say, okay, so what is that? Well, they want the stitching to be strong. They want the rivets to stay attached to the pockets. They don't want any damage to the fabric and uh, uh, these types of things. I said, okay, well, that might be the case, but I'm still going to go out and do it because you know, the, the regional manager, uh, my local boss, uh, and I agree that we're just going to do it. We're going to go out and talk to the, the most important customers in the Paris area. And um, I did, and I resisted all suggestions of lists of questions and just went out and said to them, essentially, what could we do better? And the answers that I got back were completely different from what any of the corporate people or even from what I expected. The, the two main things that came up were, uh, number one, uh, if you're going to deliver, if you say you're going to deliver us on Thursday morning, 
you've got to deliver us on Thursday morning because I've arranged for my family members to come around or my friends to come around and help me take the cartons out of the truck and all, all of that. I said, okay, but if the delivery is different from what you ordered, what are you going to do? And they said, oh, don't care. Um, we'll just put it on the shelves and sell it. And if I can't sell it by Monday, I'll send it back to you. I have to have stuff for the weekend. And then they said, and then the other problem is this. You've got, I've got women who come in and they love this stonewash jeans, but the one in their size doesn't look exactly the same as the one that they like. And you know, that led on to a whole, let's, let's say my learning a hell of a lot about the chemistry of uh, laundries and stonewashing. Now, persuading the people that needed to invest money in it was really problematic because the answers were so different from what, uh, from what the people who had the funding uh, were suggesting or expected. So I had to go through something, well, what, it, what worked was giving direct quotes and say, this is the person, they buy this much stuff from us, this is what they said. Um, but it was still tough. We did make the investments and that's what wound me up in Scotland setting up because they had the purest water, uh, setting up a nice uh, laundry process where we didn't have to play a lot for water purification. Uh, but mm. yeah, that was... So, so the argument are basically twofold. One is... Um conveying what is it what the customer was actually saying in their own words what are the things that they're um they care about and then also you also mentioned this is how much they spend with us so having the the money argument there as well yeah that's right that that mattered too now some of this is well it's where your company is an expert that technology didn't exist way back in 1982 um, because when you give people a whole list of what the customers said they pick out the things that already confirm their existing biases so even just giving the direct quote saying okay you know here's 50 direct quotes from the customers um, you know read them for yourself uh, people cherry picked and they picked uh, whatever they thought already agreed. Um, so I know that you, after Wrangler, you spent about 10 years in various roles at HP and uh, where you ended up being VP of customer experience with their 4 billion software business. What, what were some I'm, I'm, not that, I'm not that young, so it's over 30 <laughs> years, yeah, <laughs> between, yeah. So what were some greatest learnings from, from that time and, you know, the most important things you, um, you can share with us? Um, I guess the single thing that I learned that was the most important was uh, what the top three priorities of a customer experience leader are. And those top three priorities turn out to be quite different from what I expected from what I started, and they are communicate, communicate, and communicate. Meaning you can have all of the customer intelligence you like, all of the problems to, to solve, all of you know, the operational processes you like, but unless you're able to communicate the different things effectively, it's really pointless um, worrying about them. Um, and the, everything else turns out to be much less important. I was communicating internally, communicating to the customers, uh, to the partners. If you're lucky enough, which I was from time to time, you get to communicate directly to your competitors. Um, that's possibly the most fun part of the communication. Interesting. Uh, but, you know, people don't react to communication the way that you would, uh, the way that you would expect. And in, um, yeah. I know you prepared some slides um, to kind of under that underpin the the um, effective communication yep. style. Um, yep. You so can share them now. Yep, and that's where I'm going now. So the two books that set the foundation for my understanding and for what I've uh, what I'm going to talk about here are 
on the screen now. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on prospect theory that's described in the, the book on the left. And Danny Ariely's book essentially is showing that not alone do humans think irrationally, but we, that we all think in a predictably irrational way. And these people and a couple of others are the, the fathers of behavioral economics. Unfortunately, there weren't, weren't too many mothers of behavioral economics. That's uh, apparently life in the economics world. Um, but what Daniel Kahneman, uh, the, the essence of his principles are, are that humans have two ways of thinking, which he calls system one and system two. And system one is intuitive, rational, as intuitive, irrational jump to conclusion. And system two is the, the rational thing, build up an argument, uh, analyze numbers, and so on. But what his research showed really convincingly is that when our minds jump to an intuitive system one conclusion, System two doesn't engage at all. So let's pick an example here, which some of you may know. This is quite a well-known problem. So read what's on the screen here, right? The bat and the ball cost $1.10 together. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Mm. So, no matter, I'm going to say just about everybody, probably everybody who watches this or the recording um, will have had the number 10 cents jump into their minds. But that answer is wrong. Because the otherwise answer, it would be 1.20. <laughs> yeah, correct. Would, yeah. Um, so because if the... If the, bat cost, if the ball costs 10 and the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, then the bat costs a dollar and 10. So the, the ball has to cost five cents. Um, there was some quite recent research done on this uh, where even after it's explained something like 20% of people who have understood the problem don't believe the correct answer. And can, and in other words, they're not, because understanding the correct answer requires you to engage system two. Uh, but for some people, as soon as system one has jumped to the, the wrong <laughs> conclusion, you know, system two will never get engaged. It, it just shuts down. Uh, this can have fairly uh, more serious consequences. Let's look at this other problem here. Uh, so this was a, a real experiment done with you know, cancer doctors and oncologists. Half of them were told when there was a new cancer treatment that the first year survival rate was 90%. The other were told the first year mortality rate is 10%. So these two statements are functionally identical. The issue is, and this is where we get into one of the crucial points about behavioral economics. At an emotional level, they're not identical at all. Um, and the issue is what's called loss aversion. Far fewer doctors, and these are smart people, were willing to prescribe the, me the medicine when the message was about the mortality rate. Right? Uh, the people who were told about the survival rate were far more willing to do it. So now, of course, if you want to prevent action, you know, phrasing something as a, as a loss is an extremely effective way of doing that. Right? So this reminds me quite a bit of the... Uh, this reminds me of something that happened way back when Bill Clinton was president at the time I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation and I would listen to talk radio uh, uh, as I was driving around the Boston area and 
at one point, there was a proposal about health costs. And I, I think that the, that the proposal may even have been under Hillary Clinton's responsibility. I don't remember. She had a, a role in Social Security at the time, and they were trying to address costs. Um, so it was a discussion about how are we going to decide whether a patient who's seriously ill should be given this extremely expensive treatment. And what they decided to do was to set up you know, a committee of doctors and insurance uh, people for each of these cases and that these people would decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Seems rational, very system two in the way that it was put forward. The people who didn't want it to happen came up with an extremely simple system one uh, answer or opposing view. And that was, these are death panels. We're talking about death panels. And that was the end of the proposal. Mm. It took you know, quite a complicated rational explanation to put the argument for it in place and an extremely simple, you know, nasty negative answer to, to prevent it happening. So what I'd like to do is to perhaps phrase that in a real, in terms of a more real life example. And this is relatively close to home because this was an example about how would you have to discuss problems. Um, I'll just decline to mention the company because I'm not sure how sensitive a subject this would be. So problems with security software. So, Let's suppose you're in a situation, you've got security software, there are customers that have problems. For years, many, many years, my approach to this was uh, what I, I would call a pure, um, a pure appeal, a pure appeal to science. Just sharing it here. So, so this particular, this set of data isn't about the security software, but it's an extremely attractive in, infographic and we see infographics uh, about different subjects all the time. This would have been the way that I would have communicated in the past uh, up to when I understood behavioral economics. So I would have said, you know, 1% of customers had you know, maybe serious problems, 86 were fine. and. and try and have nice fancy graphics with lots of numbers nicely presented. Mm -hmm. And most of us, maybe even people who've got PhDs in um, natural language uh, processing areas uh, uh, would uh, tend to communicate in this type of way, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the issue is that this just didn't work as a method of communicating because it took too long. So, I went to a different approach and the, the different approach whoops, was like this. The photo isn't a photo of the guy, but Tomasz Novak is a real person. And I said, okay, you know, meet Tomasz. We lost his data. And because we lost his data, he lost his job. Right. And that grabbed people, right? Mm. That got people extremely excited about the whole subject and um, you know, wanting to know more. Of course, you can't scatter those things around randomly, right? Meaning it, there has to, the, the data and the facts need to be there behind it. So you start with this emotional story and then, and then present the infographic? Correct. <laughs> okay. Because the point is, once people have jumped to the correct system one conclusion, mm -hmm. generally they're very receptive about hearing your system two discussion about uh, how big a problem it is, how much money it's going to take, or people or resources it is it's, that, that it's going to take to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that works quite well. Um, so then they're probably, once they already have an emotional connection to the subject, um, this is when they're actually open and, and, and are looking for 
rational reasons to say yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as I say, I, this replaced the, my prior approach, which I've seen other people, um, yeah, many, many other people use too, the old approach, which was, okay, I can see that you don't get it, what I'm saying with the, the scientific numbers and the, the system two uh, approach. So I'm going to give you more numbers and I'm going to give you more proof and we're going to go into more detail about that. And it just doesn't work. It, it makes mm. people close their ears and they're jumping to some sort of conclusion. It, and it may be that the subject is irrelevant or maybe they've said, oh yeah, well, you know, I understand everything better than he does. So I don't need to listen to this anymore. Um, but grabbing them by the emotion first and then supporting it by uh, the numbers you know, works extraordinarily well. And I, and I noticed that in, in your example, you used um, a story of a loss rather than a story of a win. Is this on purpose? Uh, yes, because uh, it, it's if you take the customer experience uh, world, I don't know why, but humans are more attracted to reading about the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's numbers that I think originate with Gartner. They might be someone else or Forrester that uh, keep coming around every few months where they say, you know, American companies are losing you know, $440 billion annually because of bad customer service. Yeah. Um, where I could take exactly the same story and i could say american companies are winning are making an additional 440 million because of good customer service because the 440 million didn't disappear it it just stopped being spent with the bad customer service company and it started to be spent with the good uh, customer service company but people are so afraid of losing that they'll read the headline about loss first yeah now this has also one other important um, ramification for communication which is you should never communicate the negative and the positive stuff together i ideally um, i remember when mark hurd was who's now ceo of oracle was ceo of hp and he had a I'd say after about nine, 12 months at HP, he had a vision, which was that we should double the size of the sales force because he was saying the first rule of sales is you got to show up. So we need to have more salespeople so we can call on all the people who can be, who might be wanting to buy stuff in business in B2B market. And to fund this, uh, we need to, you know, we're not going to go to the market and ask them to give us money we're going to reduce the number of people that we need to do certain things. We're going to close a bunch of buildings and we're going to pay our suppliers less, which are the only three ways you can save money. Mm. And he, when he first, uh, he, he liked to get feedback when he first started giving that particular speech, which he thought was all about growth. He would get off the stage and he'd say, what did I talk to? What did I just talk about? And at the start, he was deliberately spending half of his time on you know, more salespeople for growth and half of his time on how to fund it. And the bottom line is they only heard that there were going to be job cuts and buildings closed. Mm -hmm. And they didn't hear any of the stuff around the growth. And he had to move his mix to being over 80% on the growth before the audiences heard anything about the growth. Just because they were all so worried that they were going to lose through all of it. Mm. Even, even the salespeople. I mean, you would think, oh, he's saying more salespeople. But, mm. uh, but there were no guarantees that they, the salespeople weren't working in a building that might get closed. So, yeah. So yeah, if you're going to communicate the positive stuff, don't communicate the negative stuff at the same time. Would be my message in there. Anyway. Cool.
That's really interesting. Um, so I have also prepared a, a slide for you to, um, to kind of improvise on the spot. And um, just like you did with Tomasz um, Novak, who lost his data and, and his job. Um, <laughs> often, yeah, um, what, what we do in, uh, with thematic, we um, analyze customer feedback when we find really interesting um, examples of what a company could do that uh, would drive their net promoter scores uh, up or, um, and how they can, how can they improve it? So this is, this is an example um, from real customer data, a, a bit reducted so that you can't guess what it is about. Um, yeah. You did spring this on me just before uh, <laughs> the, the conference. Can you say what industry it's in? Or would you rather not? Um, I'd rather not, but okay. the one of the really common uh, themes that we see across different industries, whether it's energy or media or um, or telco, that um, something that companies do to to acquire new customers is offer new deals to them. And loyal customers really hate it. So um, one of the negative themes, so as you can see there, uh, the, um, there's this um, diagram um, on, the, mm. on the left. And if the bars are pointing to the left, it means these themes are dragging the score down. And if the bars are pointing to the right, um, right. they're dragging the score up. So customer service is actually uh, one of the positive themes for this particular company. But sure. loyal customers is one of the top five negatives, so the number four. And um, this particular head of um, customer experience uh, mm. was, was tasked to communicate to the, um, given this data, uh, communicate to the CEO who um, is very much averse to um, spending any money on improving customer experience. Well, but he needed to um, make a case. Right. I mean, what jumps out here when you look at it? Some of the things are relatively intuitive as to what what it's about. Like I'm looking on the left around you know, the the. So there's some level of price sensitivity that's negative. The customer service is very positive, et cetera. But you're talking the breakout of where the theme is loyal customers. Yeah. Uh, some of the things on the right are just, are, uh, let's say, customer for many years, existing customers. They're, they're describing the, uh, the group. But what jumps out here is a theme around rewarding loyal customers or making offers to uh, to new customers. Um, as uh, now making the offers to the new customers, uh, and you'll have read the individual comments by clicking on the offers to new customers. Is this the loyal? Yes, I I get it that actually came up in. Um, in a company for which I did some some work, where they're saying, "Hmm, you're you're giving all sorts of special offers and discounts to people who aren't existing customers, but I can't have the same discounts. Mm. Um, you know, so this, this actually, I'd be better off leaving you, and then coming back again, come, coming back again, so that I can get the special offer." So, yeah, you know, which does seem awfully unfair, doesn't it? It feels like if you're an existing customer that you would be. Yeah, so you, you should be rewarded. Mm. Yeah, yes. And at the very least, um, it's like when I go into, a, into a, a store to buy something relatively expensive and I'm, when I'm just about done out of my paranoia, I, I will often say to the salesperson, you know, I'd be awfully disappointed if there was a special offer on this next week. Yeah. Um, 
so I get it. So it's somehow you would be you'd be communicating that the you know the rational level of communication is saying, well, you know, you're making the special offers to the to attract new customers, uh, and somehow you think that the existing customers won't see these offers. You know, but they have friends. If if this is B two B, they they might be going to the same types of conferences on the same types of things, and you know, the 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 emotional level thing is that you're you're cheating the existing customers, and yeah, I'd go with that. Actually, I would take a. Either use a stock photo if you don't want to have a real customer uh, in it. Use a real customer if they agree. And if you've got you know, a, an actual quote that says something um, you know, similar or identical, saying it would be, it'd be a version of my security software guy, wouldn't it? It'd be, hey, this is uh, Mary Smith. Who looks pretty sad in the photo? You know, we cheated her. Now she wants to leave us. Right. And maybe that's not completely fair, but it grabs attention. So and people will want to know, okay, how why how did we cheat her? Well, you know, we gave uh, Mr. Jones over there. A thirty percent discount on this stuff, and when Mary ordered it or wanted to order it, we told, "No, no, you can't get that offer unless you're a new customer." Come on, people! <laughs> you know, <laughs> I even almost regret mentioning the thirty percent number. I would want to try and keep it at the at the emotional level. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So bring it back to kind of the basic emotion that the person who is writing the comment must, must be feeling. And, yes. Um, and, and, and completely avoid a discussion of, you know, well, you know, the, this uh, particular aspect of um, that affects our most loyal customers could uh, reduce NPS by you know, almost half a point. You know, so don't That's, talk about it? Not as your leading discussion. Mm -hmm. But only you know, once they start asking questions, then... Uh, no, if you've got someone saying, I don't believe it, well, then you know, you'd have the quote, which you can get by, you know, by, the, the, by clicking on your offers to, to new customers. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you use your own software for this. Um, and yet you'll get the relevant quotes and the names of the people, which for your internal use is fine. And if you've got people who are uh, pedantic numbers people, you can show them the impact that it has. And if you've had a good um, you know, lifetime customer value model that relates to NPS built, people could do the, the system two thinking and calculations if they want to. But you know, mm. maybe the system one argument is enough. We've cheated Mary. You know, you know, not alone should we fix this for everybody, but I want you to give a 30% rebate to Mary on what she's just bought because she bought it anyway. You know? mm. um, leave it at the it's not okay to cheat people level. Yeah, and um, something that we... Um, are now doing in thematic is actually linking these themes to churn and then um, saying people who talk about things such as offers to new customers or being uh, a loyal um, customer for many years, their likelihood of churning is this much and therefore um, you could be losing this much money. Yeah. So whatever this, you're winning by acquiring new customer, you'll be losing. Agreed. And I mean, if you've done your baseline work, most people know at even an intuitive level that it, it costs you far less to keep an existing customer than it does to attract a new one. And yes. They keep delivering money. And have you got 
And in your own work, have you come across any examples of somebody you know, getting results from the software and then trying to communicate that way? Um, it's, um, I think getting, for many companies that we work with, just having a single place where people can very easily access customer feedback and read the verbatims on the topic mm -hmm. that's relevant to their specific work mm -hmm. is really interesting. So usually all of the feedback from customers sits in huge spreadsheets and you don't know how to find the piece that relates to your work. So if you, for sure. example, if you're um, a large, um, let's say software company, there will be some people responsible for billing others for the website, others again for the app, then mm -hmm. for um, the customer support. And, um, and just having the feedback there available is already a big win. Uh, but as you were talking about um, kind of bringing in the emotional aspect, I kept thinking about an example of another company that works in the space called Big Ears. They're also from New Zealand. Don't know and them. So what they do is they have this notion of customer radio where mm -hmm. it's not the verbatim, it's an actual audio of people Whoa. leaving feedback. So, um, so they would get a text message on, the, on their phone and I, would you mind leaving some feedback for us? And mm -hmm. if they respond yes, then they get a call back. Uh, I'm being asked a few questions, leave in mm -hmm. their own words what their feedback is, and then the CX person selects the um, audio recordings to then um, get to the management team to listen to them, which um, creates this emotional connection. So it's like a tool. You, you, you need the data yeah. and the graphs, but you also need the argument. Sure. And once it's real people, you know that it's not just stuff, numbers people have made up, you know, the lies, damn lies and statistics. Maybe there's one last point that I'd like to go through before we wrap. Yes. Um, and I think it's the, it's the, the general question is, uh, a, that's very common for customer experience people is, uh, how can you, how can you maintain sponsorship for your work? So let's just, See if I can talk about that. It's, uh, so for years and years, I used to think that there were three things that mattered. So this is all about making sure that your boss, your boss's boss, your company uh, is willing to invest the time the efforts, the people, the money in into your work. It applies to anywhere, but let's talk about customer experience. So question one is, you know, do senior leaders talk about it? Number, t um, And if they don't talk about it, well, you're not gonna get any sponsorship. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the second thing that I found may out in a very unpleasant way was that if you're going to have customer experience initiatives, uh, the name should be very intuitive. What happened in HP just before we acquired EDS was the company went through a, a, what we would call a restructuring, which separated the HP services business into three parts. We weren't told why, or we were told why, but not the, the real explanation, which was that we were going to acquire EDS and add you know, 150,000 people uh, into one of those three businesses. And what happened when they were going through that, they said, fine, so now we've broken HP services into three different parts. So nothing that was held at the HP services level should, be, should exist anymore. We can delete all that money, but let's make sure we're not doing anything stupid. So a set of finance people, and I know two of them very well personally, and they both gave the same story, uh, sat together in a conference room in Palo Alto, and they went down through the list of all of the spending. And at the time, there was a major corporate customer experience initiative called the Diamond 
program. A very attractive, shiny diamond. Fine. What happened in that room was the exclusively finance people said, ah, next on the, on the room, here's all these millions being spent on the diamond program. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody? Nobody did. So delete. Now, if it had been called the customer happiness program, at least they would have gone, come back and said, hmm, well, I don't think we should delete this without finding out what it is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it had the word customer and happiness in it. It, it, it matters that the project name, or your initiative names, uh, make sense at that level. The other thing, third thing that turns out to matter is can you deliver something every quarter? And, um, oh, well, I'm in Switzerland, so I'm allowed to say the following. You're in California, you, there might be danger. Um, I applied something that we used to call the pregnancy test, which is if your first major thing that you're going to deliver is more than nine months out, you're you're not pregnant. You're not going to deliver your project. And the reason being that something is bound to change in the environment that will prevent the project getting delivered. So you're better off making certain that you can deliver something meaningful every quarter uh, or more frequently and uh, that's on its own worth the investment that's being made in that quarter. Now, if I was all modern and sexy, when we started with that discussion and that uh, in which was in 2002, I would have called it agile project management. But no, <laughs> it was we weren't uh, agile hadn't come up at that point. Now, I used to think that that was all that mattered. And this is where I'm going to close the loop with the very start of our conversation today. And then Leo Apotheker became the CEO of HP. He had been the uh, CEO of SAP software, briefly, and he was briefly the CEO of HP. And he was brilliant about making certain that the senior leaders were well equipped to talk about what, uh, what he was trying to accomplish. He, um, now, he had project names that made sense. His uh, chief operating officer at the time, Martin Rizau, when I talked to him through this, he said, oh yeah, three months is too too long. I make certain we can deliver something meaningful every quarter. And yet he still failed. So why did he fail? And it turned out that there was what I call the Leo trap, which was none of it has any value if you're not able to communicate it effectively. And he couldn't. Some of that was because he did pure system two communication. And some of it was just that he changed his mind too frequently and it wasn't that clear why he was changing his mind. But it gets back to, uh, you've got to be able to communicate what you're up to effectively and communicating what you're up to effectively requires this leading with the system one emotional intuitive level communication and backing it up by science. So combining emotion and science to achieve your aims. That's really all I wanted to say today. Yeah, and um, I think that's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. And the, you know, these stories really help um, um, tie everything together and get an emotional connection to it. You don't want somebody in procurement to cross out your project just because you don't know the name <laughs> that really stuck with me um great so to to wrap up um this webinar today thank you so much maurice for joining us and uh, preparing the the slides and um sharing learnings from the the two books that um you thought you you think that every cx professional should um should read and use in their work um hopefully people who are listening to this webinar are still early in their career and can uh, benefit from using those notions of um 
Oh, yes. of, um, I, I, I can't resist doing a plug for the books. That's, of course. Yeah, I was just about to come to it. Um, yeah. So, um, actually, two plugs. One is that um, these are the three books, and I read two of them. Um, Maurice wrote four books that um, I encourage you all to read. And also, Maurice, you are open to um, consulting, right, for companies who are going through change or need some help with customer experience um, strategy. Sure, you know, I'm certainly willing to you know, go on site to teams, but also to you know, hold teleconferences with you or you know, do things via the web into your own team meetings. Since Unless you're in Switzerland, where I am, um, is a is not a very easy location, and um, well, the doing things via the web and the phone works out just fine. Cool, um, and to... yeah, you just briefly saw the the slides. So if you are interested in thematic or in customer strategy, it's very easy to find us on the web. And thank you everybody for joining. And thanks Maurice again for all of the work that you've put in today. Uh, you're very, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. Bye.